Thank you, Manette. Thank you all for um, having me. Uh, raise of hands or show of hands, how many teachers, classroom teachers? Um, administrators, principals, assistant principals. Um, people who are uh, devoted or working for introducing or maintaining the arts education curriculum. It's a good mix. Thank you for having me. Manette made me think about my first arts project. Um, I, had, I have to admit, and I'm not proud of this, but I think, you know, remember those little gadgets where you could put a little um, picture inside, a little plastic tube, and you can look at it, um, and you could see the, a bigger version, I guess, of a small picture. I used to take those things out, and my project was I wanted a little bit of theater, and I put a red ant and a black ant. <laughs> and I took that to school to show um, how these two ants just didn't get along. <laughs> and it was, for kids, I guess, the most fascinating of all the projects. <laughs> uh, needless to say that, you know, I had to empty the thing every other minute because, of course, they were killing each other. <laughs> so we often hear that our schools are not producing scientists, enough of them, engineers. But when was the last time we heard that we weren't producing enough painters, musicians, actors, or dancers. And why should that matter? American public education, ladies and gentlemen, is at a crossroads. We are ruled by indecision, by competing agendas, by the culture wars, and schools have become too easily a battleground for these things. Also because we lack a blueprint, a real blueprint for improving the quality of our public schools. Because in our attempts to improve schools, we have forgotten some very basic building blocks of what it means to be educated, well-rounded, inquisitive, creative, and open-minded. We are, in my view, in the midst of a manufactured crisis, a manufactured panic about our schools and our children. We have embarked on reforms, not so much with our children's interests in mind, but with our economic and political interests at stake. We have turned our schools into minefields for teachers. And so is the public commitment, because based on what it hears, schools are dysfunctional. As the public commitment to public education wanes, schools desperately seek handouts just to continue doing the basic things. Late last month, I, I saw an article in the New York Times about Mayor Bloomberg recently announcing that he and a handful of wealthy individuals had raised about $1.5 million to reinstate the Regents' exams, which the state of New York had canceled in January because of budget cuts. Charity has replaced the political will to fund education. 23 states and counting have drastically cut school funding this year. And I don't need to remind you here in Texas that you've made some of the deepest cuts. Parents and philanthropists are paying for classroom supplies, music, art. Corporations are plastering cafeteria walls and sports facilities with their logos. And yet, that is not enough. Schools are cutting the school week, cutting hours from the school day, raising class size, eliminating electives, and charging fees for lab equipment and all kinds of extracurricular activities, including band, the school newspaper, the drama club, the kinds of activities that often help keep kids engaged, interested. In Medina, Ohio, there are reports that it now costs $660 for a student to play on a high school sports team, $200 to join the concert choir. $50 to act in a school play. In Overland Park, Kansas, students pay $120 activity fees and a $100 learning resources fee. The Chicago Tribune recently reported that in Narville, make that Naperville, Illinois, students have to pay for textbooks, workbooks, and their advanced placement, English and French courses. In Miami this year, 4,500 students won't have access to after school programs. Pennsylvania, education cuts there total about $581 per student in the state's poorest 150 school districts. 
but only $214 per student in the 150 wealthiest districts. Arts, the music, sports are seen as luxuries that only wealthy children can afford. There is little or no understanding that these so-called perks are essential features of a balanced, basic education for all children because they promote learning, creativity, and character. The evidence is overwhelming. We, I was speaking earlier with some of your, uh, some my hosts here this morning about the schools in Houston that have shown repeatedly how test scores, for all the criticism certainly that testing gets, show and reflect a more focused child, a more learned child, when he or she has access to the arts. And so despite convincing research and strong public support, the arts remain on the margins of education, often the last to be added and the first to be dropped in times of strained budgets and shifting priorities. Alas, I, I'm preaching to the choir. But ladies and gentlemen, this is a message, and the work that you do is why it's most important at a crucial time. But let me step back here, and I actually do have to tell you one thing. I, I did, I was a little puzzled when I was invited to give this speech because, you know, this is the opening of your conference. The last person you want to hear is someone who's a doomsayer, right? Someone who is bringing to you the bad news, but that's my job. I'd love to stand up here and tell you that the stories that I've done about, I don't know, the last one was a, a story about a charter school in Chicago that was totally focused on the arts and took kids with, with extraordinary potential and talent, kids who otherwise would have been on the streets, and did remarkable things with them. I would love to hear more of those stories. I would like to say it's easy to convince people that the arts in education is worth the investment, but I can't do that. And so let me tell you what I think the big picture, if we can step back here for a minute, what I think is the fundamental problem that you may or may not regard as a direct link to the, the problems that you all have in, in supporting the arts or at least in having schools really, really take the arts education seriously, the arts education anyway, the programs at work. I want to put this in the proper context. It's hard to think of a more satisfying solution to poverty than education because it's based on this ennobling view that poor families and their children have the capacity to overcome poverty by themselves. No child left behind, which had its seedlings in Texas and certainly in cities like Houston, reflects our professed faith in the power of schools to dramatically improve children's lives. The fact is we don't really know how much schools can be made to matter, and certainly not as powerful an institution as we would like to believe. The overriding fact is that for all the work you do, whether it's preparing children to become scientists, engineers, or artists, this nation faces an unprecedented attack on the quality of life of children. James Coleman, the influential sociologist from the University of Chicago, once argued, what schools offer have little to do with students' achievement levels. In the case of low-income students, Coleman found that the quality of facilities, curriculum, and teachers accounted for no more than 35% of the variation in their academic performance. And he concluded, the inequalities imposed on children by their home, neighborhood, and peer environment are carried along to become inequalities with which they can confront, or often have to confront, adult life. Coleman's argument that schools did little to close the gap between rich and poor and simply passed along inequalities was rejected initially, or ignored back in the 1960s, as the Lyndon Johnson administration conceived and began to push the Great Society programs. The Great Society plan set out to prove that schooling could alleviate poverty, and to some degree, it worked. Go no further than to look at the results of Head Start. But where is Head Start today? 
It's on the chopping block. Coleman never suggested that we should tolerate these inequalities because rich and poor, between rich and poor, but that we should look to institutions other than schools to resolve these inequalities. That is you, the patrons of the arts, the people in private industry, the people in the private sector who must link arms and hands with the educators who every day have to deal with a child who lacks so much that the task of getting that child to perform at even the most basic level is an extraordinary task. That is why you, as people who may not be working as part of a school district, must act. Today more than ever. The economist Richard Rothstein, I don't know if any of you know Richard's uh, work. Richard Rothstein works with the Economic, Economic Policy Institute, does a lot of analysis of school funding issues and education. He said something really interesting not long ago. He said, if the goal of No Child Left Behind was to eliminate all social and class distinctions among children in terms of educational outcomes, it's a law that is destined to fail. The notion that schools alone can create equal achievement for children of different social backgrounds is not based on any research, not based on any experience, not based on any true understanding of the many, many factors that contribute to student achievement. I repeat, therein lies the role of you in the arts community who must reach out to schools to compensate for what schools cannot and should not do. For example, if you've got a group of children in poor health, meaning that they may be more absent than the average child, no matter how good their instruction, no matter how good their teacher or devoted their teacher, no matter how great their teacher's expectations, children who are absent, absent from school more are not on average going to achieve, as well as children who are present in school more time. We know that children from low-income families are absent from school more because of illness, because they don't have adequate health care, because they don't have adequate housing. You know, in our series about dropouts, I, one of the children that we followed was Danny, a, a child uh, in Baltimore, a homeless child. I met him right down the street from the school that he attended. He was living in a homeless shelter. His 13 brothers and sisters were scattered his mother was, uh, had an addiction problem, was functionally just incompetent. The woman just had so many problems. She could not care for Danny. And Danny raised all kinds of red flags because I think he only went to school out of the 180 days or so that he was supposed to. He went to school maybe 40, 50 days. Now, if you ask me, why does that child not read? Why doesn't he, um, why can't he sit still in class? Why can't, because the child was living a nightmare. So, Rothstein argues, the notion that simply by improving their education in school, they can achieve at equally high levels is at best questionable. You need to also improve the quality of their health, their living conditions. Now, Congress bought into the No Child Left Behind Act because it sounded so good to say no child will be left behind. And remember, Senator Kennedy, George Miller, Democrat of California, John Boehner, of course, President Bush, were very well-intentioned. These were not people who were cynical in approaching this, this, this problem that we have of the undereducated in our society. But they were wrong in assuming that schools could do it all. Most people think that because it makes or seems common sense that what children learn is solely a function of schooling are mistaken. For example, one major contributor to the achievement gap between poor and wealthy children is housing. If you have a school where children are moving in and out because their families can't afford housing, because they can't pay the rent or having have to double up with other families, the school cannot do as effective a job as it can with children who don't face these problems. There was a study in Texas, and I've been unable to track it down, but it was several years ago, which found that if you simply reduce the rate of mobility, 
of black children to the rate of mobility of white children in this state, you would narrow the achievement gap by 15%. That to me is remarkable. And this is information that policymakers, educators have in front of them. This isn't hard to dig up, this isn't hard to find. The research, the analysis is there for everyone to see. And yet we're blind, or at least many of us put on blinders. Lawmakers certainly have to are seldom held accountable for facing the facts and doing something totally contrary to what those facts suggest. By not dealing with a housing crisis today, where urban rents have risen much faster than the income of the working poor, and without addressing the issue, the notion that simply by having high expectations we can equalize achievements, the achievement of mobile children, children who are living on the streets in some cases. We are really missing the opportunity to once and for all create a consensus, not one that says we're gonna ask you to pay more taxes and not hold you responsible or not hold the people who spend that money responsible for making sure that kids' lives improves. But to not, I mean, remember that saying, if you think education is important, try ignorance. I think we all know what that means. If we want to put a dent in narrowing the achievement gap between children of different races and social classes, we need to operate on all these fronts. We need to understand that it is not just schools and teachers. We need to understand, as I know all of you in this room understand, that you all have a role to play. You know, the demographer, uh, a guy named Hodgkins, uh, presented a pretty scary projection uh, not long ago that I attended, where he said that increasingly, because we are an aging society, he saw in certain states a dramatic rise in retired folks, especially the Southwest, and a dramatic decrease in the number of people who had kids in schools. Now, maybe these retired folks had grandkids in schools. But there, in his analysis, he's found that there was a disinvestment that mirrored these drops in both school-age kids as well, or at least the parents who have school-age kids, and the parents or the grandparents who don't. And in some parts of my state where I grew up, this disinvestment is especially pernicious because you run into communities or you go into communities where the attitude is, those children are not our children. They're not Americans. They're immigrants. They may not even be legal. Why should I be asked to pay for their education? It is too pervasive an attitude that is growing in this country. Let me just begin to wind this down, and I do want, I desperately want questions from you because I, I, I was telling someone earlier that I learned so much from the questions that you all have. I want to raise the issue of civil rights as an issue of education because we hear that. Rhetorically, we hear people talk about education and school reform as the civil rights issue of our day. I, I partly believe that. But I think that what people who say that tend to propagate is a myth. And the myth is this, that everything that happens to children outside school doesn't really matter, whether it's health care or housing, dysfunctional communities, crime, the only thing that matters is whether teachers have high expectations of children. And you know how that has distorted the conversation we should be having. The teacher bashing that is going on in this country. And by, I, by the way, am often accused of it as well. The teacher bashing that is going on in this country is remarkable. It's dangerous. It's poisonous. Because for every teacher that doesn't belong in the, in, in the classroom, for, and you all know some of them, for every teacher that isn't doing his or her best for those children, there are hundreds of teachers who give everything. In my 20 years, I've met too many to deny this, to say that the teaching profession is somehow not up to snuff. 
If anything else, we are hearing and seeing more devoted, dedicated young people enter this profession. Maybe it's because they see what's on the horizon and they say, I, as a member of society, as an American, must not allow that horizon to come true. And so there is a myth that the only thing that matters is whether teachers can get their act together. Even though we know that No Child Left Behind is not going to equalize the achievement of low-income children. And my conclusion is that I don't think that we should make public policy, certainly educational policy, on the basis of a myth. Because, because of this myth, we've de-emphasized what this country really owes our children. We have forgotten about the crisis in so many, so many other areas of young people's lives. And America's agenda, America's vast and growing inequalities have no place on our education agenda. So I salute you. I would like to believe that your efforts can duplicate, that walking out of this hall today would be a fresh start for many of you who are trying desperately to get this city, this state, your political leaders to listen and to look at the evidence seriously. I would like to believe that you're all on a mission and that you're not going to rest until every child in Houston, at least in that world that you can have some say in, that every child in Houston has the opportunity. You cannot push down this down people's throats. You know that. But if the arts has the impact that we all know it does on children, every child should have access to something that gives them a sense of passion, a sense of hope. And I'd like to believe that what begins here, just like No Child Left Behind did, has ripple effects beyond Houston, beyond Texas. And that people someday could look to Houston and say, that's where it all began. That's where children for once had the option and the opportunity to make the arts part of their education, part of their training, because we all know they're going to need it. Thank you. I'll take some questions. I'm Patricia Gross with Houston PBS. Uh, we've been hearing about the dropout rate um, for a long time, and yet we don't see solutions. What I'd like for you to do, please, is share with us some talking points, some ideas on solutions, so we can start focusing on the right agenda, as you say, and for all of us um, to really make a difference. Thank you. Well, you're asking me to solve the problem, and I don't think I have an answer here. Um, <laughs> you know, we tried to approach these stories we did with, um, or at least end these stories with some uplifting thing, note. Um, and we, we really struggled because the status quo is the status quo. Children will fall through the cracks. The problem in American public education is that uh, we have standardized public education so much that we are not open to the alternatives that some of these children require and demand. Uh, Chicago was a good example, though, of a system that had created uh, 22 charter schools just for, just for um, dropouts. Now, the dropout rate in these schools was pretty high, too. It was close to 35%. So even when schools went out of their way to invest, put resources into <laughs> alternative settings, and I don't know, that, that can mean anything, right? It can mean uh, giving a child or a, a young person um, a second chance at, at trying something they're very good at at giving that student um, a tutor, a mentor, someone they could really cling on to and say, yeah, I, I think I have a lot to learn from this, this person, this adult. It may not even be an adult. It could be a peer. Um, when you create a space, a schedule, um, a curricula, curriculum that says, we're going to take your needs and adapt them 
to the instruction that we can deliver. Versus, if you don't learn this way, you're out of here. You don't belong here, which is the message that kids get every day. You know, the expulsion and suspension rate story out of Texas um, a few weeks ago, in talking to folks in Amarillo, in um, Plano, I think, you know, in the interviews we did, we kept hearing administrators say, my hands are tied. I know this kid needs help, but I, I don't have the money and I don't have the resources and I don't have the patience to deal with a child that needs an enor enormous amount of help. And I'm being held accountable, you all know this, for that kid's test scores. Never mind that that child doesn't eat, drinks too much, spends little or no time studying if they study at all. I mean, when you have kids' lives turned upside down, what can a school do? And so the dropout problem in this country is going to, in my view, and I hate to say it, might get worse before it gets better. We now have um, you know, this 48-state compact of, of, of people agreeing to a standardized curriculum. Now, that is a double-edged sword. Do we need to keep schools accountable and, and to make sure that everybody's on the same page? I mean, literally, in some places? Yes, because the public demands it. The public wants to know that its money's being well spent. But what does that mean? Does that mean that Frank, that 16-year-old who doesn't show up to class nearly as often as he shows up to the corner to sell drugs, does that mean that we just give up on these kids? You know, in our follow-up, and we are planning a follow-up um, to all our stories, I'm going to be in Chicago in December to follow up with the first story about Patrick. Patrick, a kid with an IQ of 180, a kid who learns, I mean, who had this extraordinary memory, I mean, a kid who had these amazing skills and who spent two years in jail for stealing boats off the Chicago River. That student is going to graduate from an alternative program in January. But you know, I came away feeling like he's not going to be out of the woods when he leaves because he still lives in a neighborhood where he's enticed every day. He is, he is still leading a group, I mean, a, a gang. He says he's not dealing anymore. But here's a kid who's, de who's living a double life, someone who's realized that he doesn't want to spend another day in jail but someone who doesn't know whether the system is going to reward him for his good behavior either. He's got a couple of job offers. He could go to college. Does he know how to navigate that? Now, in his case, he's got an extraordinary mentor. And by the way, when we were talking to him, I remember I asked him, if you had to think about it twice, would you go back to help one of your friends who got you in trouble to begin with dealing drugs? He said, I wouldn't think about it twice, because that guy saved my life more than once. And his mentor, I remember, stopped the recording we were doing, and he said, I can't believe you just said that, Patrick. Don't you realize that we saved your life? That we took you out of the streets, and we gave you the tools with which you can just prosper and, and flourish? And you're saying you're more loyal to those people who are responsible for the fix you were in, and almost dismissing. I mean, he was saying this, and Patrick got choked up a little, but he never took it back. He said, you don't understand. You don't understand what I owe many of the bad people that you talk about on my, on my streets. So it's a long-winded answer to your question about whether there is an answer out there. I think that basically, paying attention to the issue. You know, and you could argue that this administration, the Obama administration, and even Congress, have raised all the right questions and all the right issues. Are they in a position to solve anything? No. Are the states in a position to solve things? Yes. Is the state of Texas concerned about dropouts is, your, is really the question. And I'm not so sure I know the answer to that. So another question. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. I'm Dan Kamen. Uh, by education, I'm a lawyer, but in my heart, I'm a visual and performing artist. And uh, 
I was, uh, I grew up in the arts, so it's a big priority with me, and I think that this Houston Arts, arts uh, Partners is a terrific idea. But um, we live in a, st in a state where the arts always gets left behind. And uh, I don't know, I would like to have an opinion from you as far as how uh, teachers and educators in this state can uh, make a difference, I mean a real difference. You know, can you imagine Rick Perry uh, applauding uh, a performance of the arts over a football game? Uh, that's just not going to happen, and it, it never has. And, and traditionally, it's always been pennies for the arts and hundreds of dollars for the sports. So uh, while everything you say I agree with and I think is vitally important, what is the roadmap? What is the uh, strategy for uh, individual teachers and educators to uh, bring uh, this objective into uh, fruition. You know, I have to tell you, um, as with all things, um, I think that parents are the missing link in this discussion. You know, my, my daughter loves to write poetry. If I didn't support her and read her poems and encourage her and even step out and, 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 and often mention to her teachers that she has a really gifted way of working with words and being her advocate, um, she wouldn't be nearly as interested, nearly as confident. You know, missing, um, the missing link in public education is the parent. Every time I do a story where, you know, we talk about problems, whether it's dropouts or, or anything else. The flood of email and responses to the stories by almost 80% are angry emails about where are the parents in these kids' lives? Where, where are they? What is their role? You know, there was a time, and I, I don't believe, by the way, in the myth of the golden era of public education. I believe in a time when schools were an extension of that parent in many cases, where authority, where the sense of a child's sense of right and wrong came from home, but was reflected in the school. And like I said earlier, schools are paralyzed. They've become minefields of cultural correctness, political correctness, and teachers are hapless. Teachers are in no position, I'm sorry to say, to advocate for students. Now, isn't that an irony? The best teachers are the ones who take a child beyond that child's own imagination of what they can do. We've all known teachers like that. There's many of you in the, in the classroom, here in this room. But in today's climate, what has taken over is the blame game. And what has really, really corroded the public's trust is this growing perception that teachers don't care, that an arts teacher, even for all the money and time that they spend out of their own pocket to get a child to just consider the possibilities of being a great artist, of being a great painter, of being a great singer, that teacher is taking an enormous risk. That teacher is isolated from the rest of his or her community because they've taken this extraordinary step to try and help a child achieve what that child could never imagine they could achieve. I'm serious. You know, teachers are left on a lurch in today's society. And when it comes to politicians, I'm in no position to judge one way or the other whether Governor Perry supports the arts or not. That's an opinion that you all hold to yourselves. But I will tell you that the reason that the arts, the evidence about what the arts means to children, is so neglected is because of the constant drumbeat since 1983 or Nation at Risk that we were losing our way, 
that we were going to be swallowed up and chewed by, today anyway, China and India. And this constant reminder of how we cannot compete in this world we live in is what drives and often, often misguides public policy about education, from local to national. And I see this every day. I keep reminding my editor that the last place I should be doing stories about education is Washington, D.C., following Secretary Duncan around or looking at every proclamation he makes, because in many ways, he's irrelevant. He's irrelevant in the sense that he doesn't really matter when it comes to the day that you close your door and teach those 25, 30, I don't know, 40 children. <laughs> but he does matter when it comes to that pulpit that he has. When it comes to making those proclamations, and those reverberate everywhere. I, um, I don't know what a teacher, what else teachers can do, educators can do, even those here who, who have done what they've been doing in support of the arts for decades. I don't know what else they can do. Um, it's easy, I guess, to assume that for every child that you deal with, the expectation is that you can only help one at a time. Hopefully, again, in a system like Houston's, there is enough of a presence of mind when it comes to the worth and the value of, of arts education that you're not isolated, that you can call someone and say, I'm struggling with this issue. What do I do if, if we lose the funding that we've had for the last five years or the last 10 years, and all of a sudden, all of it is gone? Where are the ideas for replacing that, for doing something that doesn't make this condition that, that desperate? But I'll tell you, you must persevere. Because for any of you to chuck it, to say, you know, it's not worth my time anymore. I'm fighting an uphill battle. The city or the county or the, the state, they don't appreciate what I do. I think that that would be an enormous mistake. It would be great to come back here someday, maybe soon, and see how far this this drive that you all seem to have, how far it can go, how many people you can change, how many governors you can change. Thank you.